Hello. Oh, we're on. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you, everybody. We're going to get started with this next session. And um, we will be talking about strangers to... Uh, sorry, speaking to strangers about HD, and we have some of the wonderful HD Yo ambassadors here to share um, how they talk to strangers and also loved ones about HD. Um, so we have um, Tess, who will be facilitating the discussion, and we also have Claudia and Bruce and Anne Elizabeth. So thank you very much, and we look forward to the discussion. So, good morning, or I don't know if lunchtime, but yeah, anyways. <laughs> uh, so, we are going to do a quick introduction, uh, just to a little bit about our background. So, I'm Tess from Sweden, I'm HD positive, and I am advocating a lot for HD uh, from, since I started 16 years ago. Uh, and I've been involved in a couple of different uh, associations, uh, lots of international ones, uh, because in Sweden it doesn't happen that much. Um, but yeah, that's me. I'm 47, so I'm a little bit older. Uh, so, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Claudia, I'm 25 uh, from Italy. I'm untested. I have, my mom has HD, and uh, I'm an ambassador because as Tess, I just want to connect with people and find people like me. Hi, I am Anne. I am originally from Sweden, but I have been living in Colombia where my mom's family is from three years ago now. Uh, so I am in a lot of different associations. I'm trying to get into Latin America more. Um, and yeah, being an ambassador has uh, been a dream of mine because in Sweden and Colombia as well, in Latin America, it has been like impossible to make our voice heard globally. So this way it makes it really easy for us all to be heard since we're so many. And hello, I'm Bruce. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm from Scotland, um, and part, I've been part of the SHA since about 2014. Uh, I've been a HDYO ambassador for a couple of years as well now. Uh, I'm a PhD student in robotics, uh, and I join, H, well, I join HDU ambassadors and various other programs to try and give back for support and kind of confidence building activities that I've um, gained and taken part in over the years. Yeah, so, okay, um, we, I think we're going to start to talk a little bit about uh, when, when was, like, the first time for you guys uh, to hear about Huntington's? Uh, well, the first time I heard about HD was when I was 18, because my, my mom has HD since 2006, but they didn't want to tell me because they didn't feel like I was ready. When I was in high school, I googled my mom, my mom's meds, and it turned out as like Alzheimer's meds. So I was okay. My mom has Alzheimer. I'm good. And then when I was 18, I first uh, they first told me, and I remember at first I didn't want to talk about it, see about it, hear about it. I didn't want to do like anything about it. And then I met HD, I met HDO, and it was like a wake up call for me. It was like okay, I'm not alone. Like all these people are going through the same stuff as me, and so I can connect with them. Mm, yeah. Well, it's kind of complicated because my uncle already was in the mid-stages when I was born, but nobody told me like why he was so shaky or why my mom and dad uh, kept insisting him to be careful when he held me. So uh, I didn't really quite understand, but I knew that he was sick in some way. But when I heard Huntington's was when I was around five, six years old, because that's when both my mom and I started to realize my dad was showing symptoms. And my mom was already asking if my dad could get tested to make sure if he had it or not. Uh, so I was really young, and I didn't quite understand anything. So it was 
very scary as a kid when no one explained anything and I wasn't like 12 years old when I really realized what Huntington was and that I, I was at risk myself. So it was sad that the doctors and professionals said to my parents to never say anything to your kids about HD because that's the worst thing you can do because we start imagining bad, negative things in our minds. So that's how it happened to me. Um, so I was also quite young, I was 14 um, when originally I was told about it. I do remember it very vividly because it was one of those moments where it's one of those permanent memories. Um, but we were, we were sitting in the living room and my parents kind of sat me down and were like, your dad has Huntington's. And I was like, okay, what is that? Um, they told me the basics. They didn't understand a lot of what it was. Um, and I then went upstairs, tried to look it up, found out I was at risk as well, uh, found out various more facts about how devastating it was. Um, and then I went back downstairs, tried to ask them questions. They had no idea. Um, and then I got in contact with the Scottish Hunting Association. Um, and then they helped me out from there, which was pretty pivotal. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And I can just say that for me, because I didn't have the Huntington's until I was, was in my 30s. So it's pretty different to have it with, at that young age that you guys have it. So in my teenage, even if I lived in a family, so I, we had it rough with my dad, but like I said, we didn't know anything until I was 30. I can't even imagine to be like 15 or whatever. So awesome guy's job. Uh, can, uh, there is so so many things to 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 be said. And uh, um, do you have like uh, friends or family that um, w sometimes they mean they, when, when they talk to you about HD? Do they have like? Do they understand? Do they have uh, like answers that you think? It, this is okay. Do they understand, or they're just saying something for a good, well, meaning? You know. Do you, how do you handle that if you? Well, <laughs> first of all, it depends if it's in person or if it's uh, through a message, because I've had lately uh, now that I started uni again. Uh, a lot of my friends wonder, like, what, what is HD? Why is your dad not here? And so on. So what the first thing I do is just send them the Spanish version of HDO, where it explains very well uh, how the disease works. And I tell them that it's a very broad uh, disease because they say, like, a couple of symptoms, but not every person has all of those symptoms. So. Uh, yeah, I explain that and I tell them like, okay, well in my dad's case, he sadly enough had all of the symptoms in the textbook basically, which made it very hard for me. Uh, but I tell them that, well, you have to differentiate, uh, you always have to separate the person and the disease. So it's, even though I tell them some of the symptoms, I tell them that uh, my dad is, a guy who likes rock and roll music and football and goes to the pubs whenever he feels like it. And then the disease is this thing that made him worse and made it impossible for him to walk and do those things, but not fully. And even if there are behavioral changes, he's still my dad. And uh, that doesn't take away the title. Uh, so I try to always be like, positive about it, like uh, I do give them the information, but I always try to be as positive as, as I can because uh, I believe that many of us, even when we Google or talk, it's mostly negative and I don't want anyone to be scared of this. I want them to, one day when they see a person with HD, they realize, oh yeah, Anne told me these things, but I have to know that even if they're moving a lot, I shouldn't be scared. I should still talk and be patient and listen to them, even if they have uh, difficulty speaking or such. So that's kind of the things I do. Yes. 
Yeah, for me, it was quite weird because when I found out about HD, like all the people in my life, they already knew. Like my, my school knew about it, my best friend knew about it, my cousins knew about it, like everyone knew about it because they, my, my parents told them because they had to be prepared like in case I, I found out on my own. But at first it was like being in a Truman show because I was just going to my friends and at school saying, you know, I found out about this. And they were like, oh yeah, no, I already knew. And I was like, oh, so everyone in my life knew about it. And so I started like connecting the dots. Like why when I was in elementary school, I wasn't at home and I was always, I don't know, maybe to a cousin or to a friend or why didn't we have such long vacations? And it all started to, to connect and uh, at first it was so overwhelming and, and, and bad because it was like something of mine that everyone already knew. But then I just started to talk about it and as Anne said, like, you have to explain to them what HD is because nobody knows what HD is. Like you have, you have the websites, you have the brochures, you have the textbook, but it's not like you can fully understand and so you, you have to explain it to them. Like my friends, they're, they're awesome. Like they're always, always there for me to support me, to listen to me. But actually I, it's not their fault. Like they, they can't understand me fully, but they support me. They support me and uh, here is where I feel like I'm, I'm really yeah. with people that understand. Yeah. It, it comes up quite a lot at university, not only with other students, but various other staff members I speak to, because I work there as well. Um, and it is, it's a difficult to, one to kind of explain when at the same time you're trying to set up your future career, because you have to tell them, yeah, so I have a 50% risk of having this, but also, can you please give me a job in the future? Um, which is, they can often look at you strange. Um, but in terms of actually, what do I say? It, it's usually easier to relate it to personal circumstances, of yeah. course. Um, I explain what dad's going through, I explain how we help him, and I usually go for the three M's, the mind, mood, and movement, go through those various symptoms, and then also explain that it's similar to existing diseases. Um, like, you, like both of you said, not everyone, no, definitely not everyone, um, very few people know what Huntington's is, mm. um, and a majority of people you have to pretty much build it from the ground up, but taking things from other diseases, as much as it's not very nice, um, it can usually help them at least relate relatively faster. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That's why also, I mean, this community that we have, it's extremely important. And not only for us as, as an ambassador and you guys coming here, you know, most of you are here for your first time. So, I mean, there are so many steps, but I think what most people are saying, when they finally get into the community, they know that, you know, I am home. I can speak freely, I can, you know. So, that's why we are all trying to, to just keep educating. So, uh, but how do you cope? How do you cope, like, with friends and uh, family ones, may, because it's not not always that you can talk to the whole family, for example, about the disease. How do you cope when you have someone around you, loved one maybe, or? Well, I have the worst of luck. I am at risk, and sadly, well, since my dad passed away three years ago, I don't have anyone on his family side left alive and on my mom's side I basically have my mom, two uncles and two cousins and that's it. So it's really hard to have someone to fully understand you because they, on my mom's side, they really don't get what HD is and sometimes it's the same with my mom that there is still information that she isn't aware of. So what I do to cope, uh, because as well with my friends, work and everything, uh, I actually go to uh, the Swedish Huntington Association and talk to members. I talk with HDO friends, 
friends from camps uh, that we had before, um, even professionals. I always have a psychologist with me, uh, so I'm very grateful for that because she's really good. So I can talk with her about my worries about the future, me being at risk, me being the only child and family member left on when it comes to HD. And uh, yeah, having all of that support system helps a lot because sadly not all of your friends or family members <laughs> that you love dearly can help you with everything. So it's good to have. Uh, the extra family, as we call it, <laughs> like you guys, uh, that's the best thing that, that can happen, to be honest. Um, I, I found it described quite well in the talk you gave yesterday, sorry, uh, on relationships, um, essentially how various people in various situations fill various needs. Um, for me especially, the need of having support relating to HD comes not only from my youth worker and things, but primarily friends who are in similar situations. Um, that's my main coping area, being able to talk about things. Um, and I've said it a couple of times to various people that I've spoke to here, um, but as much, these events are great in terms of actual talks and panels and things. Um, but one of the greatest things about them all is being able to talk to other young people in a similar situation in an organic and casual way. And from there, you get so much out of it. We are like, yeah, I'm not alone. This is, mm. like, this is a nice feeling. Yeah, I think it's, it's the same for me. Like in, in my family, we, we talk about HD, but we just talk about advocating and Congress and events, but we never talk about how we really feel. And so whenever I, I need to, to cope in, in some way, I just, I just connect with my HD family because it's uh, even being here and knowing that there is someone, even if it's in, in Sweden or in Colombia or everywhere in the world, but they, they can understand you. Like you don't even need to explain it to them. You just have to say, okay, I'm feeling, I don't know, I, I had to caregive for my mom for two weeks and now I'm feeling really, really bad. And my mic it's not working yeah. anymore. I do a talk, <laughs> but that's it, like, that is my way of coping. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, so it, when, when it comes to doctors, for example, do you have, like, have you met any, uh, any doctor or that you really go to the doctor and talk about Huntington's and they don't know what you are talking about? Have any of you like experienced that? Uh, if not with yourself, with your loved ones, or oh yeah, it happened to me. Like my my therapist, I I love her. As I said, like I love her. She's a blessing for me. But she she didn't know anything about HD, like literally anything. So I spent the first like three sessions explaining to her what. HD is what being at risk means, and and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had friends who study in the university, like to become doctors or nurses, and they actually asked me about HD because they couldn't understand it through the textbook. And so they asked me, like, okay, I need to understand this more. Mm -hmm. And so I explain it. Yeah, it's the, it's the same here, like. And just the area in general that uh, a lot of people don't know or they have a textbook version that is from 1970s or something that is not accurate <laughs> at all anymore. So I always have to explain, no, it's like this, it's like this. Um, my dad is like this and you have to be aware because I usually bring it up because as a young caregiver, uh, that can cause a lot of mental health issues, and those mental health issues can end up uh, affecting the rest of your body. So when you go to the doctor, it's, it's actually good to say you're a young caregiver, especially with someone with Huntington's, because all that anxiety and stress of taking care of someone uh, does make you sick. It does make you sick. And sadly, the doctors and the nurses are not aware of this, and it's then hard to explain that. Uh, 
And you, when, when I was a teenager, I didn't even know that your anxiety could affect your health. And I was like, oh, no, but something is wrong with my stomach. I don't know why. And, it's, and it was HD related. And having to later explain to everyone uh, about the disease is very frustrating. And I even remember one time, it wasn't a doctor, it was actually my biology teacher. I told her, oh, no, but, but, but because she was asking about my dad for some reason, and I told her, oh, no, well, he's not coming for my graduation because he has HD. And she stands and looks at me and like, are you at risk? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, hugged me, and is like, oh, no, you poor thing. And I was like, what happened? This is, this is not worse at all. She's like, no, I really hope you don't get sick. Because she thought the percentage of getting HD was, was much higher than 50%. So she was so sure that I had it. And because of that reason, she actually gave me an A instead of a C. <laughs> so uh, people, be careful with this information. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes it can be good to say, about, talk about HD with anyone. <laughs> I think um, a good example that I've got is, I, I've not really had this much of an experience myself talking to kind of doctors and things about it. Um, but my parents have, where they've went to the doctors for something and our previous doctors left, we've got a new one. Um, and he just stares blankly when they're like, oh yeah, so uh, my dad has hunting tits. Well, it's, it would be my mom talking. Um, and he's like, right, okay, yeah, I've got no idea what to actually do about that. It's kind of the thing that's read about in medical school for a couple of days, um, and then not really mentioned that much afterwards. However, I have noticed in the last sort of couple of years, things have been improving in terms of even just, thankfully, yeah, our, our new doctor was very, Accommodating in the sense he was like, if you have information, leaflets or even just, you know, um, anecdotal. Yes. It's he was very happy to kind of read it and understand more. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think everyone has probably had that experience at least at least once. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I also experience um, a lot of those things, weird things, weird doctors from the beginning. But uh, I will say for the, the, every year, I believe we, um, I, I meet more and more uh, doctors that actually know just a little bit about Huntington's, and that's good. Yeah. So we are getting there. Uh, but uh, how, what is your biggest piece of advice for people to bring uh, to like approach people with HD or do you have um, given information? Do you always uh, do you have like a prepared speech or something that if you you meet someone you know? Yeah, well, <laughs> I have anxiety, so <laughs> I have like options A to C <laughs> of things to say depending on the person. And uh, if it's a friend of mine, then I know, like, okay, I explain the basics. And if they ask something, I, I'll just respond because I know the answers basically, usually. <laughs> and when it comes to a stranger that, then I go the, the ambassador way of explaining what the disease is about. Uh, and what symptoms my dad had, basically. But I don't like bringing up, for instance, that I'm at risk because a lot of people start asking, oh, when are you getting tested? You should get tested. Oh, but t you should know, it's very important. And then it's like, no, <laughs> that's, that's a decision I have to make. And uh, that's what we've been talking about before. And, it's actually, I think that's the question I get the most, and it's very frustrating. It's not even about HD. It's just, oh, have you get, gotten tested yet? Why do you, don't you want to know? And I have to always say that. And th that's my to-go answer that. Uh, would you, if there was a test for cancer, would you take it <clears throat> right straight away? And they go quiet. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, 
Yeah, because it tells you that if, you, if you're in the last stage of cancer, would you like to know? Oh, no, no, that would be awful. Ah, you would like to know around what age I, you would die. Oh, no, that, that's not right. I don't think that's comfortable. Yeah, but it's the same with the question. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's what I do. Uh, there were, yeah, there was a couple of points that I thought midway through. Um, for immediate kind of, how, how do I explain it? Um, I mentioned earlier on mind mood movement relating to other diseases. That's usually my go-to. Um, and again, depending on what um, what kind of relationship I have with them, obviously, yeah, you, you adjust kind of how you explain whether you have an impact or whether it's just someone related to you that, yeah. or in whatever circumstance it may be. Um, the question of, oh, uh, would I get tested or um, all that kind of question usually comes up and the response usually makes for good stories um, in the sense of, the, the, yeah, I think, again, there's a lot of common experiences where everyone has dealt with somebody who's like, you should get tested or I would get tested. Mm. Um, and even in the sense of when you try and explain to them what the answer would be, um, or sorry, what, how you would respond when you got the answer, um, it's difficult to explain that both possible answers also come with their own respective worries. Yeah. And guilt, yeah. If that's me or if that's something else. Um, but yeah. So I think it's basically the same for me, for, for everyone else. Like, funny story, I had to, to do my passport to come here because mine was expired. And when I called like the, the passport office to, to ask for it, I was like, okay, I need to go to, to Glasgow for a medical congress about this, this disease that affects my family. And the guy on the phone was like, okay, can you bring me a medical certificate stating that you have the disease so that your passport will be ready like quickly? And I was like, no, but I, I don't know if I have it. Like, I, I'm not tested. And he was like, oh, but can't you just get tested? <laughs> and I was, at first, I was like so mad at him. And then I realized that it's, it's just ignorance. It's not being, being bad or being a bad person. It's like he, he didn't know what, what it meant to me. Like, and everyone keeps asking me the same. Like, why don't you get tested? Mm. It will be better to know. You should know. Mm. You should prepare your future. And I was like, okay, you, you just said it. It's my future, so I'm going to handle this way. Maybe someone else is ready to know, but, but I'm not. And uh, I actually have a quote, because it's, it's my dad's quote. I'm going to quote my dad. <laughs> he always say that Huntington is like a boat, and you have to row all in the same direction. Otherwise, you're just going in circles. But what it, it took me so long to understand that you, and I even wrote it on the wall of hope, you have to row at your own pace. Like for me, it's maybe staying with my mom once a week, and that's it's enough. It's enough for me because more than that, it's really so much painful for me. And maybe someone else has another pace, and he can he or she can be I don't know caregiving for a whole month. And you just have to to learn your pace and understand that it's not selfish. Like we have a session right now that's called self care isn't selfish. It's like preservation for. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your uh, sharings, your sharing your story. And mm, it's also important, I want to say, because uh, like me, that I'm tested uh, gene positive and uh, I'm not working anymore. And uh, a lot of uh, questions that I have back home is that, but what are you doing all day, you know? Because they look at me and see that you, I mean, you, you can walk, you can talk, you can do, you know, and I'm just, so my advice always is always about the mental issues, the psychological part, because that's what I'm dealing with. And that, you know, you don't have the energy, you are drained, you're having a brain fatigue, uh, you are depressed, you have anxiety, and uh, if you're having a good day, you still need to do these easy things that is so common for people. Go in the shower, go to the shops, go out of bed, uh, walking the dog. So in the everyday life, I feel we, we always need to try to defend and explain. 
But thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah, we're wrapping up for the day. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing each of your experiences. So we, we are at the time, but we could probably squeeze in one or two questions. So does anybody have any burning questions they want to ask? Yeah? Nobody? Hey, thank you. Um, so when I get home, I'm giving a presentation on everything that I learned because I, as expected, am the only one in my tiny little college university who has this disease and I uh, undeniably will never shut up about it and this is probably the 80th presentation about Huntington's I've probably given in the last 15 years or so. Um, and so when you're trying to explain it to people who know nothing, you were like describing like you had your spiel that you give a through C, based on how well you know these people, can you give more specific uh, examples of like maybe what your spiel would be? Is it working? Okay. Am I okay? No, no. <laughs> uh, no, but for someone who doesn't know anything about HD, what I do is I tell them, "Do you know what Parkinson's is?" And they say, "Yes." Do you know what Alzheimer's is? Yes. Do you know what ALS is? Yes. Normally they say yes to all of those three di diseases that exist. So I tell them, well, basically it's like having all of those three combined. Uh, obviously not all of the symptoms, uh, because like I told you, uh, each person is different, but that's basically how the disease works and that. Uh, depending on the person, you can be sick for 15, 20, and now it can even go up to 25 years uh, before passing. And for everyone, it's different how uh, sick they will get by this disease because some people may not have a lot of symptoms and some may have a lot and get worse really fast. Uh, so that's what I explain uh, to make sure. and that's when they really understand like, okay, they have involuntary movements, they have behavioral issues, uh, memory issues, uh, stuff like that and that, like, like Tess said as well, that, that it's not only all of the stuff you can see on the outside, it's also what's happening on the inside as well. So paranoia, depression, anxiety, uh, also, OCD-like symptoms as well, where they start repeating certain tasks at home, like making coffee, and then making coffee, and then making coffee again. Always depending on the person, but usually those are the kinds of things that I explain. I just want to add that one thing I do, in order, because it's important to me that people understand that HD, it's, it's wide. Like you have all, it's, it's like a spectrum and you, you get to be here or here or maybe early here and then here. And so I always say, you know, there are people that are, have been diagnosed and then passed away in two years. There are people that are 60, are positive and uh, have no symptoms. There is my grandma. My grandma was, was ill for 25 years and she was cured for Alzheimer for like all her life because nobody knew what HD was. And so these are like three examples, th so different. And they, they like, they get you this perspective. Like it's very, very, very subjective. Um, I just wanted to add one other quick thing. Um, it was, it, it, the way of explaining the symptoms, yeah, usually I go to disease other like-like diseases, um, or mind with movement. But one of the things I, I do struggle a little bit to try and verbalize is the kind of time span that it's over. Um, a lot of other diseases, I mean, motor neuron disease, the prognosis is a year and a half or something like that. Cancer and things, obviously, they have um, generally shorter spans that they will uh, happen over. And then Huntington's, you have to try and explain that 
you watch somebody slowly lose every single one of their faculties over about 20 years or so. Um, and then once you've watched them do it, you have a chance of doing that yourself. And trying to explain that and put it in a kind of words which um, don't make people go, oh, um, can be quite difficult. <laughs> the symptoms, thankfully, people already are, are used to symptoms existing like those, just in other diseases. That's the, the prognosis that I kind of find a bit more difficult to, to explain. Thank you. Are there, is there time for one more question? One more question. I think this might have to be the last one. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, what do you say when you don't want to talk about it with people? Because like, I know adv advocacy is very important, but obviously not everyone is ready at the drop of a hat to go into like the ABCs of uh, their lives and share kind of like their whole story. So, And especially in situations like you said, where uh, it affects your job, it affects your work environment. How do you uh, create space to not be an advocate? I just, I skip the name and I go with the science. Like, even like, if you're not like a science student, you, you don't like big scientific words. And so I just say, okay, my mom has a neurodegenerative disease. And I just, I stop there. And I, I just, I don't go. And I don't say Huntington because people can just Google it and understand that about me. And when I was like doing job interviews, it was like that because I didn't want like people to know about me because it really, it can affect your job. Like I know people that they didn't get jobs because of it and it's, it's stressful. So sometimes, yeah, in this situation, I just, I don't say the name, I just say my mom is healed, she has some problems with the motor and movement and brain, but I don't say HD. I just wanted to add because it's harder for you guys. I've been working, you know, so it, for me it was more like I need to decide to quit, even if I still want to work in a way, but I have to think about my health. And that was the toughest for me to decide that I can't do my job anymore because of, I have so many issues that just going up and go away to the work in the morning, it's, it wasn't possible for me anymore. Uh, but that also gives you uh, uh, of this um, s space that where you know where who am I? You know, so s for me, I can just c continue to to t uh, to talk about the disease. But if I weren't ha been working before, I should probably do the same not mention the disease, but I could talk to my, all my uh, colleagues knew about it when I got my test and whatever. Uh, and I knew before they said, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> but anyway, but yeah. But then you have the trouble to just, who are you when you're not working anymore? Uh, and that, that's also uh, like a, a big part of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you again for the questions and for sharing your experiences and your advice. I think it's been an excellent session and we can break now, so thank you.